Check one, two, my check one, two, okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, thank you. It's so good to see you, those of you in the room. Welcome to those who are watching uh, this um, in various parts of the country. Um, but to those in the room, welcome to the Frances Perkins Building, uh, which as many of you know, was named for the first woman labor secretary and the first woman cabinet member of any president. And we are here in our Cesar Chavez Auditorium, uh, which is named in honor of a farm worker who helped found the union and the movement that brought farm workers out of the shadows. Which is fitting because today we're going to hear from leaders who have transformed the labor movement and are showing that a different world uh, is, is possible. Um, and this is all the more fitting because our president has articulated a um, clear vision for our economy. Uh, where dramatic growth in good union jobs is not only possible through policies and investment, but essential to his vision of what makes a good economy. And uh, within that vision is um, not just the creation of good union jobs in every community across the country, 
but making sure that those communities actually get those jobs. So here at the Department of Labor, we are laser focused on, uh, on delivering on that vision. Uh, you hear the president talk a lot about from the bottom up and the middle out. And in order to do that, it's uh, important for us to start with those workers who have been at the bottom for far too long, uh, where you know workers don't enjoy the basic protections, um, a just day's pay for a hard day's work, where they go to work in the morning and aren't sure if they're gonna come home safely at the end of the day, and where um, s many workers have been shut out altogether of opportunities for good jobs uh, due to discrimination, occupational segregation, and other kinds of marginalization. So we can't build the economy that President Biden envisions unless we fix those, those things. Um, the racial wealth, wealth gap in the United States uh, persists, and in 2019, the median wealth for a white household was $184,000. For a black household, it was $23,000. A white family's wealth is eight times higher than that of the average black family. So closing this racial wealth gap is a top priority of the Biden-Harris administration, of our labor secretary, Secretary Walsh, of me, and the entire Department of Labor, not just during Black History Month, but every month. The president's policies, there's two trillion some dollars in investments in infrastructure, in manufacturing, in our shared uh, climate future are game changing. Uh, the good jobs that are gonna be created are going to repair roads and bridges and lay down uh, clean pipes for drinking water. We're gonna build electric vehicles from uh, coast to coast. We're gonna start manufacturing microchips more here in the United States. These themselves will transform communities across America, but we have to be intentional that the jobs that are created are good jobs and that all communities have access to those jobs. And that's part of what we're gonna be talking about here today. That's also why we've been working with our sister agencies, the Departments of Energy, Commerce, and Transportation to embed these principles of job quality and equity in all the money that goes out. And through that work, many of whom, uh, the people who lead that within the department are sitting here with you today, we have embedded such language in almost $100 billion in federal investments. Um, and, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. Um, and that's gonna result in project labor agreements, in community benefits agreements that prioritize local hiring, in training programs with apprenticeships and, uh, and pre-apprenticeship programs with community colleges, with wraparound services so people get the jobs that, that are gonna rebuild their own communities. This is not just a matter of being fair, it's about how we create a strong and resilient economy. By one report, if the black wage, education, housing, and investing gaps have been closed 20 years ago, it would have added an estimated $16 trillion to the economy, with the black pay gap alone accounting for $2.7 trillion. In addition, a 2019 McKinsey report estimated that if we close the racial wealth gap for black Americans, it could raise US GDP by four to 6% by 2028. I don't know how many economic policies have that kind of outcome, but it's clear that ending structural racism is good for the economy. Uh, a few months ago, I got to travel to Nashville where we had a round table with the mayor, with community-based organizations, and with the Central Labor Council to talk about concerns that jobs that are created there are often not good jobs, and when they are good jobs, that people who live in Nashville don't get them. And from that meeting, the Department of Labor has helped to form a task force on good jobs made up of community members on the ground who are committed to different outcomes this time. So as we endeavor to make equity real on the ground with the federal investments and a bottom-up, middle-out economic policy, I think a lot about the long and rich history of black Americans who've led struggles at the intersection of racial justice and economic justice. From the Memphis sanitation workers strike to the efforts of black domestic workers to organize for better working conditions, to the fight for 15 and a union, and many more path-breaking campaigns that black workers have been on the front lines at the forefront of in this country. Union organizing is one of the most important ways to strengthen and expand a black middle class. And we know that when we expand the black middle class, we expand and uplift the entire middle class. So today, 11.5% of black workers are members of a union. That's the highest rate of any major racial group. Union representation also narrows racial pay gaps. 
unionization increases pay for black workers by 17.3% compared to 10.1% for white workers. We also know that care work is the work that makes all other work possible. So as we build the infrastructure of roads and bridges and clean water and broadband funded by federal investments, we also need to build the care infrastructure. This means both focusing on access to childcare, which you will hear about today, so that workers can go to work, especially women who still bear a disproportionate uh, amount of childcare responsibilities, and on good jobs in the care sector so that care workers themselves have economic security and a path to the middle class and a right to join a union. So one of the things that the secretary and I love to do is to create opportunities for voices to be heard inside this building. And today we have brought together some of the most powerful voices in our country to talk about all of these issues and more. Our all-star panel is about making equity real, black workers and good jobs includes the AFL-CIO Secretary Treasurer, Fred Redman. I know. The highest ranking African American in, uh, in the labor movement. We have SEIU Secretary Treasurer, April Verrett. Uh, similarly, um, history making in so many ways. We have Sherry Woolard, who is a fourth year apprentice with United Association of Journeymen and apprentices of the plumbing and pipe fitting industry who is showing everybody what is possible in an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And Crystal Barksdale, an early childhood <laughs> education provider who is also an SEO, SEIU member. And then following the panel, we're actually gonna hear from Deputy Secretary Don Graves of the Department of Commerce to reflect on this moment and the shared leadership of all of us in the Biden-Harris administration to advance the president's vision. So we are excited about this conversation and the collective work that we're, uh, that we're all doing together. But before I call up the panelists, I'm gonna call up someone who needs no introduction in this building or really in most buildings across this country. Um, Secretary Marty Walsh has, since the moment he got here, set a clear vision that matches the president's for this department. He has um, made it clear that we are to do everything every single day, um, all day, to empower workers across this country. And he has done that both through his life's work and his incredible leadership here at the Department of Labor. And I'm grateful to him for his friendship uh, and for everything he's done uh, for all of us here to make my job possible too. So Secretary Walsh. Thank you very much. And, and I wanna thank you, Julie. Uh, you know, um, when, I, when I got appointed to this job, uh, Julie was also, both of our names were mentioned in the conversation, actually a couple other people. And, and after I got appointed to the job, uh, I went out and met with Julie out in California and I talked to her about uh, if she'd be interested in coming working as a team. Uh, and I don't think, she didn't know me, I didn't know her. She didn't know what I meant by team. And, and truly we have been a team uh, in everything that we've done here at the Department of Labor. And it's great when, when we do this work around equity or any type of work, but really around equity, when you have a partner in that work that believes the same way you believe or you believe the same way they believe, it makes the work so much easier. So thank you, Julie, for all your great work here and everything else. I wanna thank everyone for coming today uh, to honor Black History Month and help move us forward here, uh, not just at the Department of Labor, but certainly in the country. Uh, to the union leaders, workers, advocates, groups, to our civil rights activists, uh, everyone who's watching virtually, thank you for, for tuning in or being here in person today. Uh, we have an incredible deal, all staff and team here that does so, many, so much work. And I want to give two shout outs today. And I, I could shout out more than two people, but I'm going to shout out only two right now. Uh, one is Caitlin Walker Mooney, uh, the policy advisor who leads our Good Jobs Initiative. And our Chief Diversity and Equity Officer, Alicia Black Hackett. When I met both these women, um, as I mentioned with Julie, sometimes you just connect. Uh, and when I met both these women, um, uh, Caitlin was here, Alethea came here afterwards. Uh, when we had our first meeting before she came in here, uh, we just connected. Uh, and, and I talked about what we did in the city of Boston and what we didn't do in the city of Boston. More importantly, uh, talking about where the gaps are and, and we talked about how do we move forward and, and we've done some great work and there's so many other folks here from the DOL team, I want to say thank you. Not just because I shout out two people doesn't mean we don't love and respect all the work you all do. So thank you very much for all the work that you do as well. Um, 
Our special guests that are here today, uh, we're looking forward to the panel. I won't go too much into them, but Fred was elected uh, the first African-American Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO, uh, along with uh, the President, Liz Schuler. Uh, that truly is historic leadership at the AFL-CIO, and I want to thank Fred. But more importantly, Fred, thank you for the work you've done in the past. I mean, that's stuff that, that was recognized, so thank you very much. Um, April from the SEIU, Secretary of Treasury at SEIU, uh, thank you for all your great work and, and what you do at SEIU, representing thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people all across the country. I'm going up in that number, but thank you for that as well. Um, uh, Sherry, uh, we talked a minute ago. Um, union apprentice, going to be a journey person pretty soon. Uh, really thinking about that opportunity to to get in there and, and, and really think about how do we do unionization in North Carolina, by the way, on top of it also. Thank you very much. And, and we, that's a good clap right there. And Crystal, who has gone through probably um, three of the most challenging years in child care in the history of the United States of America, when you think about it, with, between COVID, uh, not really being prepared before COVID, going through COVID, as we get through COVID, uh, really understand the importance of child care, not just simply by taking care of our children, but the respect that child care workers deserve and need with good salaries, good wages, good benefits, working conditions, and opportunities to advance themselves. So thank you. Uh, as you can imagine, I've been just reflecting on a lot of different opportunities I've had as Secretary of Labor, and one of my priorities was to get out of the office as much as possible and, and go around the country to see workers all across the country. Uh, it was not only to, to share the president's agenda, but it was to meet workers in our country, to meet workers where they're at in our country, to understand, to hear directly from them about their experiences, their needs, and their ideas. And I want their voices uh, to guide our priorities and, and continuing as we continue to move forward here. Some of the most impactful trips I had were built around black history. Uh, they were not only uh, about understanding the root of economic injustice in our country, they were about recognizing, quite honestly, leadership of black workers and what black, who, what black workers have shown that leadership in civil rights, in the labor movement, and, and in making our economy better. Um, Deputy Secretary Sewer, he talked about it. My very first trip was to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, in May of 2021 as Secretary of Labor, and I had a chance to, uh, to go all around. I went to a job course center in Memphis, I got, got a chance to go there. Uh, but I went to um, Ask Me Local 1733, and that is a, um, the union that represented the, the sanitation workers in the 1968 strike. And I had a chance to, those workers, three of those workers I met with uh, were still alive from that strike and, and had a chance to march with Dr. King. And we had a chance to hear their story about that time and what was going on in Memphis in 1968 uh, and what the challenges have been since that point till today. We also visited a job course center. In November 2021, I visited Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we had uh, an event at Kelly Ingram Park, a place that uh, is hallowed ground for the civil rights movement. It was where we launched the uh, federal minimum wage, $15 now that the president has signed, and we launched it there. Uh, and, and we were there because black workers led the fight for, the fight for 15. And we were in that ground thinking about, for me, it was important being there as a kind of as, as a secretary of labor, but as a labor leader, former labor leader, uh, in that park with civil rights, where it didn't begin there, but really this, the focal point, a lot of it was in Birmingham, Alabama, and the importance of what was happening in that park and around that neighborhood, um, certainly important. And in, in probably the most profound visit I had was uh, in 2022, in June of 2022, I went down and visited the Mississippi Delta region. Uh, and I went down there because um, we had heard about some black farm workers wanting to talk to us. So I had a round table with six black farm workers in the very beginning of that day. Um, and um, they were talking about what they were experiencing in their life. And they're being taken advantage of. Uh, they're being taken advantage of because farmers down there uh, were very tied into the H2A program bringing in farmers from around the world to work in their areas. And these black farmers who were from the neighborhood, from the area, were teaching these other farmers basically how to do their job. And that wasn't the atrocity. It was the atrocity was when I heard about the way they're being treated. And when one black farmer told me that um, the bathroom for them, for the black farmers were outside and the bathroom for the white farmers from South Africa were inside. And I thought to myself, it's 2022. 
how can this be? And I, I, I realized that about three, three of the six farmers were, couldn't read or write. But you could see in their hands how they worked hard. And, and I often said this, one farmer to my right, he, um, his hands were just callous from working, and he was an older guy. And, and my father is a white Irish Catholic guy from Ireland. This farmer was a black farmer from, from Mississippi. And I realized both of them just worked hard every day to support their family. And they didn't deserve that treatment. And we, we took action. We came back here uh, to the Department of Labor. I brought everyone in the meeting. It was kind of the angriest I've ever been. And we started to put a team together. And we put basically, I don't know what the right word for it is, because if the press is watching, it was kind of a strike force team. <laughs> Let me be very clear on that right now. And we went down there, and we, we did an investigation. And the Department of Labor has a, United States Department of Labor has a presence down there right now, making sure no worker, no worker take, is taken advantage of in this country and making sure that we're doing what we have to do. And we're going to remain vigilant until discrimination uh, is taken out of that industry. And we have to continue to do that. Uh, two weeks ago, on, on one of my final trips, I visited Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and I, had a, I toured the Greenwood District. Over a century ago, um, you know, black businesses were burned to the ground. Uh, and black Wall Street was burned to the ground. People said it was a riot. It wasn't a riot. It was, it was racism at its core. Uh, and these businesses were burned to the ground. Uh, people there today and people after that time started to rebuild black Wall Street. And we had a chance to go down to watch that movement and, and that tradition or, or that business moving forward of rebuilding black Wall Street. History shows us that incredible barriers that black businesses and workers have faced. And the legacies of that history live on in economic systems here today. Deputy Sue talked about that in the, the gap between white workers and black workers. We have work to do in our country. We have lots of work to do in our country. I often say, um, you know, these four trips that I just talked about had tremendous impacts, not just on me, but on the team that went down with me. And we had a chance. To, and, 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 and a lot, of the, a lot of the folks that came with me knew the history, obviously. We all knew the history. But you don't understand the history until you're walking in the street. You don't understand the history until you're walking into a building. When somebody says, this building survived being burnt to the ground. The business didn't survive, but the building did. And then you see a business in that building that are, that, that are working to, to rebuild. When you talk to farmers that were discriminated against, and they have every reason not to go on to go back to work. But those six farmers I talked about, all of them would go back to work today for their job full time. They're discouraged, but they're not being held back from what they need to do for their family and how they want to rebuild and create opportunities. We talk about celebrating Black History Month. It's every month. It can't just be in the month of February. If we truly want to close the economic wealth gap, if we truly want to eliminate racism, if we truly want to make a difference, it can't be from the 1st of February to the 28th of February, and then every four years we get an extra day. It can't be that. We have work to do today and now, and the work that's happening by many of you in this room watching TV is happening. Early childhood educators in Wisconsin are talking about not being able to afford child care for their own children. Black women in the trades are leading a nationwide movement for equity in their industry. Black auto workers in Michigan showed us that union workers can build the future with electric vehicles. Nurses in Florida advocated for health equity. I also want to thank the black leaders in this department who have been thoughtful, strategic, and determined about changing how we do the work, about bringing equity to life, and about making it real for the lives of working people in the work that Caitlin is doing and other folks are doing here. The Good Jobs Initiative, real quickly, and I'll stop in a minute because I know we want to hear the panels. When, when the Good Jobs Initiative was kind of launched or, or was talked about at first, we're like, yeah, it's a good idea. You know, um, it's a good, real good idea. Uh, it, it, because it, the, the way it was explained, it actually is a good idea. But like many other initiatives, if initiatives talked about and we have a great name for it, which we do, it's great. It's a great initiative for the press release. But it can't be a great initiative just for the press release. It's about making sure black workers and underrepresented workers have access to good jobs. We're pushing that, not just here at the Department of Labor, but across the other agencies, across the other cabinets, to let them know. We're in a meeting last week talking about it with Mitch Landrew. It's about making sure that 
workers have rights to, to unionization if they want to get unionized, and if they want membership of unions, they should be able to join a union. That should be, an, uh, that should be automatic. It's about making sure that all jobs are good jobs because we know that care work is skilled and essential work depends on our economy. We put special focus on federal investments that are equitable investments. Why do we do that? Because the President has passed his historic piece of legislation, whether it's the Infrastructure Bill, the CHIPS Bill, the, the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and any other bill that he's done. These bills are all about creating jobs and opportunities, not just construction jobs, but long-term jobs for families that are life-sustaining jobs that close the gap that Deputy Secretary Sue talked about between black families and white families. You want to close the gap? The way you close the gap is by giving somebody a good job and giving many people good jobs so that many more people get good jobs. That 28,000 all of a sudden goes up now, and our economy is different. So far, in all the work that we're doing, so far we've impacted $97.4 billion in federal funding, and I know the Department of Labor is going to keep doing that work f moving forward. Today, today, we get another opportunity to listen and learn from black workers and black labor leaders in this country. Their voices here at the Department of Labor are here to inform us and guide us on the work that we do and what we all need to do. And we're going to hear from them directly today. So when you think about the diversity of the background of our panelists, it's so important. We have a man who led a union for a long time and is now at the top of all the unions in the country. We have a woman who runs one of, was second in one of the largest unions in the country that really focus on our care's economy and focus on nursing and so many other areas, janitors and airport workers and SAU covers everything. Child care specialists talking about the need for adequate child care and also to respect their workers. And most importantly, an apprentice. An apprentice had an opportunity to get into a union that is life changing. Because when she finishes her apprenticeship and when she gets into become a journey person and finish her career, hopefully she'll be vested in a pension. She'll be able to support her family for generations to come. So I want to say thank you all. I look forward to the conversation. Now that we're all fired up and warmed up, <laughs> it's only going to get better from here. So um, I just thought it'd be really nice for um, everyone to know a little bit about the four of you beyond what is in the bios that people can find and beyond what um, the secretary have already said. So you know, all of us get to where we are because of our personal journey. And I just was hoping you would each share um, very quickly what the personal journey is that brought you to this point. Um, why are you uh, committed to um, the issues we're talking about today? Um, and how does your personal journey inform your views on what it means um, for black workers to get a real shot in this economy? And I'm gonna start with our Secretary Treasurer, Fred Redman. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary. And not only thank you for this panel, but thank you for everything that you do. And the Secretary Walsh, thank you for being consistent, a consistent voice for working people throughout this country. We appreciate you. <laughs> My journey started as the son of two sharecroppers from the Delta in Mississippi, who made that great migration from the South to the North in the 1950s wound it up on the south side of Chicago, uh, had four boys, and uh, the only thing that they wanted out of life was a better life for their sons than they had in the red clay dirt in Mississippi. They were willing to work hard. My father came to Chicago uh, with a 10th grade education. He uh, pumped gas stock shelves at the supermarket, haul scrap middle between jobs. My mother was a high school graduate who came. Her and my father got buried in Mississippi then headed north. And my mother was a domestic. She got up every morning and took three buses to go out to a place called Skokie, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And she cleaned other folks' houses and she cooked their food. But they had a vision 
they had a vision that, you know, America can work for them. And, um, you know, my father, he, uh, one day he got a union job. He lucked up, got a job in an aluminum mill outside of the city of Chicago. And I went through a human transformation. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we had health care insurance. We stopped going to the free clinic. Mama stopped shopping at Goodwill. She went to Sears and Roebuck, <laughs> OK? <laughs> My father brought a brand new used car. <laughs> and um, you know, I know what the, what the labor movement can do to uplift and move people into the middle class. I followed my father into the mill, and I'm a second generation steel worker. My father challenged me to get involved. I got involved. I love the work. I love speaking up for people. I had a pres former president of steel workers, Lynn Williams, told me one time, you have the opportunity as a representative of this union to represent people who by no fault of their own is unable to represent themselves. Okay, and I fell in love with the work. Came up through the ranks of the union, worked for the steel workers international. Uh, union for many years, and um, you know, my father used to take bets that maybe he's going to wind up in jail or somewhere stuck on the night shift. And he, I, I know that he's smiling down on me to be the highest ranking African American in history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think so many of us have a story that is similar, and just a, an example of how when you break down barriers for black workers, you break them down for everybody. When you break down discrimination for black workers, you break down for everybody. Uh, my story about how we got into the middle class is the exact same thing. My mom got a union job that ensured the steady paycheck, the uh, you know predictable hours uh, that made all the difference. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Secretary Treasurer Verrett, you wanted to go next? Thanks. Uh I just want to call you Julie because she's my old friend, Debsec. Uh, I'm going to be uh, appropriate. Um, but I just have to start by saying you don't get trillions of dollars in investment in care by a president that has stood up for workers and unions without a team like Secretary Walsh and Deputy Secretary Sue. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, great things come from the south side of Chicago. <laughs> that is something that my dear brother Fred and I share in common. Um, my story is very similar. My, my people, like most uh, black folks in Chicago, have roots in the South, um, in Mississippi specifically. Um, I was raised by my grandmother. Both of my parents died when I was very young. I was two weeks old when my mother died. I was six years old when my father died. My grandmother, who raised my sister and I, died of colon cancer at 67. The three things in common um, I have learned between my mother, my father, and my grandmother, and I truly believe they died way too young from things that were preventable because they were black and poor in this country. And so um, when I began my career as an organizer, almost 23 years ago uh, in SEIU organizing healthcare workers, nurses specifically in Chicago, I was searching for something. And uh, I'll never forget the first union election that I helped workers win. And I saw workers dance in the street um, because they won their union. I knew I found my place and I knew I found my purpose, and I knew I found a way to make it right so that people who lived like my parents lived didn't have to die like my parents died. And so I, <laughs> and so I do the work that I do because I wanna eliminate poverty work in this country, and to do that I have to eliminate structural racism and help workers find their own voice. Because I know clearly, just like those workers at Roseland Hospital danced in the street because they saw the demonstration of their personal power and what collective power can do for communities and for workers, right, I was hooked. And so I have been an organizer. You can give me a lot of fancy titles, but I will live and work um, in this movement as an organizer with workers who, who realize their power and who want to combine that power with other workers to make transformational change. And I know I will make my parents proud, um, and we will eliminate poverty wage work in this country. 
Mm. So I feel like I keep wanting to say Secretary Treasurer because it gives me chills to do that. And I, and I know it's true for somebody in this room and people who look like us don't always end up in the positions that we're in. So uh, to use your title is really an honor. But I really appreciate what you said about friendship and sisterhood. So I think we will move to first names uh, here and they'll make it a lot less of a mouthful to say what we need to say. So, um, so with that, Sherry, can I turn it over to you to just tell us how you got to where you are? Um, I started in the uh, apprenticeship because I wanted to learn HVAC. That was my, my main reason for um, joining the apprenticeship. Um, I wanted to um, learn the right way to, to do the job. So um, I just started in the apprenticeship, taking the classes and applying what I learned in the classes in the field. So great, so great Sherry. And Crystal. Hello. Um, Crystal Barksdale, my story would be both of my, it's funny, both of my grandparents, grandmothers. Um, I grew up in Cherry Hill in Baltimore City. So both of my grandmothers lived on the same street. One at the top, one at the bottom. <laughs> one grandmother had eight children. Uh, the grandmother had two. But both of them, between the entire street, cared for all the kids collectively in that neighborhood. If I go into any part of uh, Baltimore and I say who my grandmother is, Miss Eaton, they'll know exactly who Miss Eaton is. Mm -hmm. They'll know exactly who Miss Ruth is, because Miss Ruth was their Medea. Mm -hmm. So they'll know exactly who she is. But I watched how they cared for the children their children and the neighborhood children. And it was kind of embedded in me on what I wanted to do. I was quote unquote babysitting children when I was a teenager, but I'm grown. <laughs> this is a profession, this is a career, and it's going to be respected as that, as long as I'm in this union. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. So I got into, I got into the, um, the SEIU union, because providers in Maryland were not being respected for the job that they did. I am doing a job the state promised to pay for the service that I'm providing, pay me when you're supposed to, not three months later. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the care now, give me the, the funds for the care, make sure the funds are available. It's no reason why the profession, the profession that we are in is looked upon as in, I'll pay you when I get a chance. I'm not caring when I get a chance. I'm doing this work when I do this work. And I'm not doing it just be, I love the kids. I do. I love those babies. I do. I love it when they come back to see me when they're 20 years old. I do. But I also have to take care of my family. I have a husband. I have three children. I have a grandson. I have a dog. That dog needs to eat. <laughs> my kids are grown, but they still depend on me to lead them and show them what they need to do in order to live in their profession. And we talk about generational wealth. How can I give them generational wealth if the people that see what I do don't look at it as a worthy profession? Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Crystal. I think that point that um, it's almost unique or more prevalent in the care world where the, the, the assumption that like if you love it, then somehow we don't need to honor it in the same way. And the fact that you do love it is really one of the reasons why we really should um, make sure that it's a good job that everybody who does it gets treated the way that you deserve to. So let me move to um, something that we've already talked about this morning, right, which is that worker organizing and unions are demonstrated to increase wages uh, and reduce racial wealth gaps for black workers. Um, we've shared a number of different statistics, but black workers represented by a union are paid 13.1% more than their non-unionized black peers. And workers who are not organized in unions are especially vulnerable to low quality jobs, to uh, unsafe conditions, to um, workplace violations. Uh, and then there's black worker centers across the country who are also organizing in complementary ways. Crystal, I'm gonna go back to you to just ask you, what does a good job mean to you? And how has your work helped parents realize their personal and professional goals? 
Ooh, this is going to be good. So I just want to let you know I'm going to try to stay on task. <laughs> so a good job to me means the ability to work safely, um, the ability to unionize if I, if I so see fit to do that, the opportunity to unionize. And in some places, you don't have the opportunity, but I think that's, that's one part of a good job. Biggest thing for me is respect. You need to respect me in what I do. Why do I say that? Because you drop your kids off at, to me every day, and you trust this crazy person to care for your child every day. And in that respect, you need to understand that I am educating. I'm not babysitting. I'm not watching. The stories are not on. I do not know what Victor Newman is doing on a daily basis. <laughs> I really don't. But there you go. <laughs> I do not know that. What I know is Dr. Seuss has a, a set of rhyming books that we're going to go through from birth to five years old. When you leave care at my daycare, when you leave, we want to make sure, our focus is to make sure that you are on a reading level of first or second grade at five. That is the goal. So with that being said, thank y'all. With that being said, that needs to be looked at as something extravagant, something that is worth the respect. That to me is a good job. That I, I want to make, and I want to make sure my daughter, who works with me, is able. If she wants to, because she may not, but if she wants to go on her own path of caring for children, she has an incentive to do so. And right now, it's not that much of an incentive to do so because it's not looked at as something that people want to do because it's not respected. Thank you, Crystal. Um, Secretary Treasures, actually April and Fred, um, what do you see as the role of worker organizing and unions in black workers getting good jobs and strengthening the black middle class? Well, I, I, uh, I think that the role of the labor movement is enormous because it's going to take the labor movement to really, really organize black workers into the trade union movement. The numbers are real. I mean, black workers that work in unions make more than those who do the same work that don't. So I think we have to be very, very intentional about our desire to, um, or our necessity to organize black workers. But I do want to say that we have to understand that the labor laws do not favor organizing. So we have to be very intentional about changing the laws in this country to make it easier for workers who want to join a union to join a union without threats and intimidations from their employers. And then, and then we would ask for federal help from the government. I mean, you know, we see, you know, these are great programs. We have an opportunity to do some real stuff, okay? Uh, you know, the FHA had opportunity to really bridge that, we that, that, that whole wealth gap. But the FHA, a government agency, okay, when you look at its inception, all right, they, they, they used to would not uh, uh, do mortgages, okay, and, and insure mortgages in black communities. But they turned around, okay, and funded builders who was building homes in communities with the understanding that you won't rent these homes, you won't sell these homes to black people. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of money flowing through these programs. A lot of contractors is going to get checks. A lot of people is going to get paid to do good work. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us and the administration, our friends, the best labor president we've seen in our lifetime. But I think it's incumbent to let people know from the top of this administration, okay, that we want to buy American we want to hire minorities. We want you to meet the specs. And we want you to give jobs to people in underserved communities. I think the government has some control and can help us organize more workers. But I think that they can really, really uh, influence the contractors that's going to be getting a pile of this money to make sure that they do not participate in union busting. Mm -hmm. So. 
I would second everything Fred said. We have to, in this country, shine a light on what truly happens when workers want to stand up and join organizations. Um, and we can no longer tolerate uh, the corporate uh, behavior that is seen, particularly from workers in the private sector, when they try to form unions. There's been a um, all of this great organizing that has happened from Amazon to Starbucks to REI um, all over the country. But the reality is that today, not one of those workers who we have you know, celebrated has gotten a union contract. Right. And so we have to make sure we are supporting workers, not just posting, um, you know, a, a meme, right, to support them, but actually seeing them through the entire process of being able to build and to hold on and to use power in the workplace. And we also have to um, accept, I believe, that some of the laws that we have that govern how workers form unions and the structures of unions are outdated. Right, we are in the 21st century. We need to think about what's a 21st century union in a 21st century economy for 21st century workers that got 21st century problems, right? And, and it is time for us to really think about how we grow our movement and how we support workers so that they can continue to win. And like, let's listen to, to black folk, right? Um, they lead the way so very often, and the resilience and the brilliance of our communities have been the backbone of the labor movement for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure those folks are allowed to lead us into the future. Sherry, I'm going to ask you a question before I turn it over to our secretary to reflect on everything that he's hearing here. but. I just want to make sure everybody heard what Sherry said at the beginning, which is Sherry was already doing maintenance work before she joined the apprenticeship program, but she did it because she saw so many people who weren't doing it the right way and wanted to make sure that she was doing it the right way. And so that initiative, um, I really just wanted to highlight again and say that Sherry flew here from North Carolina yesterday to join us, is flying back today because she has to go to work tonight. So <laughs> Sherry... <laughs> Um, what you don't say is as powerful in terms of what you do as what, as, as what you do say. So let me ask you, as a fourth year apprentice mm -hmm. in a registered apprenticeship program, uh, you aren't yet making full union wages, right? right. Um, and, but registered apprenticeships do provide a debt-free way to learn skills and then to um, have wage progressions that increase um, over your career. Mm -hmm. Why are you participating? in this registered apprenticeship program, what value are you, are you getting from it? And as the secretary said, you, are, um, you, you really represent our hope for what the economy could look like um, if everybody were given the opportunity that you have. So tell us a little bit about why you're doing it. Um, I wanted to, well, learning the right way to do things and um, being in an pr apprenticeship has helped me build confidence in being able to diagnose issues that I come across in um, in HVAC. And it's given me the opportunity to change the narrative that um, black women can be, you know, great in this industry. You know, so I wanted to to just to try it. You know, it was like every job that I've ever had. Um, so I've been working in maintenance since 2013. And every job that I've had, um, I'm always the only girl in in maintenance. I've never worked with another woman in maintenance, especially not another black woman. And I want that to change, you know, so I'm like I know that we're capable of doing the work, you know, we just need to be um shown how the right way to do it. That's right. Way to so. go. You know, there's a lot of messages up here today that, that we keep hearing. And I think that, you know, just to sum up some, kind of what Fred said, um, the fastest way into the middle class in a lot of ways is through organized labor. And I think there's still a lot of work that has to be done by organized labor to educate people on, on what organized labor is all about. Um, April said about the 21st century union. I'd say that all the time. Uh, we need a 21st century union. It's not the same not same union my father was in or I was in. Uh, but but you know, and also letting people know government has to understand, not just federal government, local government has to understand that 
when you go out and talk about equity, you talk about transparency, you talk about creating pathways, organized labor is the fastest, best way you can do it for your community in any part of this country, whether it's a federal level or it's a city. And, and I think that that's something that, that's important that we, that we have moving forward here. Uh, the one thing I I'd just like to say is that we need to continue this message off the stage. Uh, I think it's important for us to talk about this stuff outside, and I think it's an education of our members as well. I mean, we don't have strong labor laws because we don't have a Congress that, that looks that way to, to support those strong labor laws. We, we, we don't have uh, more protections in these bills because we don't have enough people in the, in the legislature to get the language inside the bills that guarantee that it's PLAs and project labor agreements and not just building the construction piece, but most importantly for the labor movement, it's the jobs that have to happen after construction. These jobs, these companies are going to be here for 30 years, 40 years. So, um, no, I wanted to say thank you all for what I'm hearing up here, and I think it's really important to hear from you, so I'm going to stop talking right now. <laughs> thank you, Secretary. I'm going to um, dig a little bit deeper on what you said, Fred, about these investments and what happens with contractors and building on the Secretary's point that, you know, how do we turn all this conversation to something that's real? Um, and just to um, say again what we've said, there are some two trillion dollars in investments that are uh, that are about to be made um, and are being made now. And many of these investments are gonna be in the Southeast. So here at the Department of Labor, the Secretary and I and our teams have talked a lot about um, what, what ha what's happening in the Southeast and why it's happening in the Southeast. Um, we know that workers do not have the same opportunities to organize um, in uh, many of the states in the southern part of the country. Uh, you've mentioned the broader challenges all around, which are true, um, but not all regions uh, experience barriers to organizing equally. Um, of the 10 states with the lowest union membership, seven are in the south. Of the 12 states that have the worst working conditions for workers, eight are in the south. Um, and half of the black population in the United States lives in the South. So none of these are accident or coincidence, right? So Fred, talk to us about, you know, what do you think we need to do so that we can have effective implementation of these investments so they truly benefit black workers? And, you know, what are the dangers and consequences if we don't do that right? And maybe you can share a little bit about what the AFL-CIO is doing on this. Well, thank you for that. And, 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 and first, let me start off We've seen the danger and the consequences about not doing nothing. Uh, organized labor pushed the New Deal back in the 30s. They pushed the New Deal. But black folks really didn't uh, uh, benefit from the New Deal until years later because we were dealing in a, in, a, in a period called Jim Crow. During Eisenhower's reconstruction of the interstate highways, this was before Title VII. This was before the Civil Rights Act. So black folks really did not gain a lot and when it comes to job creation, okay, during, during, uh, during that uh, infrastructure push. So I'm saying that to say we have to get this right. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to bridge that wage gap that you talked about, Julie, and to really, really deal with the inequity in terms of wage disparities. So what do we need to do? First of all, we need to be intentional. And I need to give a big shout out right now to the North American Building Trade Unions, NAPTU. NAPTU have, yeah, let's give it up. Let's say the North American Building Trades have just invested, just invested a huge uh, uh, amount of dollars in defining a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. I went to the rollout and I read the full plan and it covers everything that we're talking about and the need to be more inclusive and the building trades are more deliberate and intentional in terms of bringing in uh, people from underserved communities, particularly people of color. You know, because look, you know, I mean, we, we're at a point in our society and our labor movement where rising tide lifts all votes, right? So the more and more that black people are risen up in terms of being economically disadvantaged, we all benefit from that. So what the AFL-CIO is doing, you know, look, We've partnered with uh, numerous organizations. One that I want to talk about is we formed an organization working with the building trades, working with NAV2. Uh, we're working with the Chris Gardner Foundation. Chris Gardner, the, the, the author of the book, The Pursuit of Happiness. Will Smith portrayed him in the movie. And what we found out that Chris was going into the high schools doing his motivational 
uh, uh, talk to these students about the importance of staying in schools. And what we added to Chris's piece was the jobs piece. Mm -hmm. So we kicked our program off a couple of months ago in Detroit. Last week we was in Austin, Texas. We going to Columbus, Ohio next. And then from there, I believe Syracuse, New York. But what we're doing is we're going into these uh, CTE schools with the building trades, and we're talking about what a career opportunity means, okay, through an apprenticeship program. We want to have more of these sisters, mm -hmm. okay, around this country. And I think we have an opportunity to do that, but we have to get out and talk about the opportunities that's available, okay? And the AFL-CIO is also trying to deal with some of the wraparound issues that, you know, that's involved in these programs. I know that the Building Trades rolled out a trial program in terms of child care in New York and Milwaukee. And, you know, we're working with our, um, uh, you know, folks like AFSCME and folks who represent the, the, the National Nurses Union. We're brainstorming with them along with NAV2 to see what we could do in order to, uh, you know, lend our voice toward the issue of child care because it's a critical issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to sustaining people while they go through apprenticeship. One of the other problems that we're seeing that we're trying to deal with is the issue of transportation. A lot of these training centers is outside of the inner city and outside of the areas, and students find it difficult to get to. So what we're doing is, you know, we're trying to develop ways. We're going to be asking folks for help, <laughs> okay? But we're trying to find ways to trying to find dollars to provide transportation to these students and you know, making sure that they can uh, really, really uh, you know, succeed by getting to the training centers. And, and, then the, and then the third thing that we're doing that I'm very excited about is in the apprenticeship program, one of the key components that's missing that organized labor is working to step up and try to fill that void is mentorships. Okay, what happens is, you know, folks go into the apprenticeship program, they get their has whopper, they, they get their OSHA certification, and they get poached by non-union contractors, okay? So we're going to use our internal constituency groups, A. Philip Randolph Institute, Coalition of Black Trade Union, Coalition of Labor Union Women, uh, Latin America Council for, for, for Latin Advancement, to mentor these students, to work with them, give them the encouragement that's necessary in order to try to give them the momentum to see the apprenticeship commitment through, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. No, um, Sherry, as Fred has already said, right, you are a trailblazer, a leader um, in so many ways. Um, and North Carolina is also the state with the second lowest union membership of all 50 states, um, right? But some people are surprised that unions exist uh, in North Carolina uh, when we talk to folks. So um, building on what Fred said, in your experience, how has NAB2 been intentional about reaching out to different communities um, to make sure that um, they're intentionally recruiting and um, empowering a diverse membership in their, um, in, in their apprenticeship programs? And how do you think black workers and communities in the South benefit from access to union jobs? I say the apprenticeship readiness programs um, is a, a big help. And um, as far as reaching out to black people, I would say um, just the marketing. Because um, me, I wasn't aware of a union. Um, I actually learned about it on Facebook. <laughs> a girl reached out to me um, about it because I wanted to, I was just ranting one day about um, not <laughs> giving the opportunity to, to learn HVAC. So um, a girl in the Midwest commented and she, was, she asked me had I tried my local union. And um, that had never crossed my mind um, mm -hmm. about start, um, starting a union. So I think if there was, um, more marketing about the union, you know, people would be more aware yeah. of um, getting, actually getting into it. But it's been great, you know, I really um, enjoy being in the union. Um, I work with a great bunch of guys at um, Johnson Controls. 
and like they're always there, always willing to help. And it's made it a lot easier, you know, getting through the apprenticeship when you're working with people who want to see you succeed, you know. You know, Sherry, there's lots of studies that show that diverse organizations are more effective and highly functioning ones. So I think you bringing your perspective and your life story and your journey into your place of work and into your uh, program is, I'm sure, uh, it's not just that they're good guys to you, but I'm sure that they're uh, that they're they're becoming better uh, in every way because of their interaction with you too. Secretary Walsh, I know this is something you just care really deeply about. Um, no, it, it's great. You know, it's great to see um, the understanding that the building trades can make an impact. I mean, the building trades. We do a lot of talk here in the in the DOL and the country about apprenticeships. But when you think about a structure that's set up for success, it's it's the not to. Uh, $2 billion uh, private investment into training centers all across the country. Um, and it is about accessibility. And it's about how do you find, how does Sherry find that pathway into those unions, those opportunities. It's no cost to the participant. Uh, best training in, in the world. And we need to take that opportunity and expo expand that. And I think here at the Department of Labor, we think about nursing. We think about uh, apprenticeship and nursing. We think about cybersecurity. Uh, we think about truck driving. Everything we talk about here, it's about inclusion and, and creating an opportunity and a pathway because a lot of people don't have those pathways. So I think it's important for us that we continue to keep the function, uh, the, the, the primary focus on um, the Good Jobs Initiative and inclusion uh, for, for uh, underrepresented communities. What does that mean? That means the black community in the United States of America has been underrepresented in almost every single place of business in the United States of America. And we have to be really focused and intentional about our work and cr changing that narrative mm -hmm. and that reality. Julie, do you mind if I just speak to this issue about workers in the South? Um, I think we have to be really clear and call it what it is. Economic exploitation in this nation started in the South with the enslavement of, of Africans. And economic exploitation continues in this country, in the South, exploiting not just black people, but brown people and working class white people. But if we don't draw, like shine a light and call it what it is, we will never be able to solve it. And it is economic exploitation that perpetuates and continues today where people in the South continue to live and to work in poverty. My, most of my family is still in Mississippi, right? Um, and we allow corporations to, to exploit people on an economic and a race so, and based on race structural racism each and every day. And in this country, we should no longer tolerate that type of behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it's like, it's not rocket science. You look at indicators about quality of life and in the South, they are the lowest, right? The highest infant mortality rate, right? The highest rate of chronic illness, the lowest level of achievement in education, right? The list goes on and on and on. And I just think we have to be able to call it what it is, support workers who want to stand up and form unions, but also no longer allow corporations to get away with exploiting people the way that they do in the South. Mm Fantastic. You know, the president says all the time, capitalism without competition is exploitation. And how do we right, create a um, true level playing field where, um, uh, where, where there isn't so much concentration that leads to um, that kind of exploitation? Um, so I am going to, April, um, pick up on what you said and shift a little bit to, um, the, to, to care. Um, you know, we talk a lot about infrastructure, the physical infrastructure of roads and bridges, and um, uh, but care is an infrastructure too, and that infrastructure needs to be just as strong as the other forms of physical infrastructure. Um, child care, for example, and many of us have already said this, um, uh, Crystal, you've said this, it's really a critical part of effectively um, allowing people to work and of making sure that that workforce is part of a, 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 a thriving economy where they also do well. And so we've been really thinking about how that fits into these federal investments that are being made. Um, and so, I mean, you know, again, to repeat the obvious, without adequate childcare, um, working people, especially women, have a harder time being in the labor market. Um, and so, 
April, can you tell us a little bit about what we need to do in this moment to build that care infrastructure that you've been so visionary about, um, especially in the context of these federal investments? And if there are examples that SEIU has been um, building, are there things that we can model and replicate across the country? Sure, thanks. Um, I, for the last you know, 15 years, I've been um, in SEIU working to help care workers build unions. In SEIU, we represent over 700,000 home care workers and over 100,000 home child care providers. And we saw during the pandemic just how um, poor the care infrastructure is in our country. Nursing homes was the epicenter, right, of, of deaths, right, at the, 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 t the tip of the spear during the COVID pandemic. We saw our how much we utilize schools, right, as places for care because our child care infrastructure isn't sufficient in this country. 10,000 seniors turn 65 every single day. And we do not have a plan mm -hmm. for how we are going to care for an aging population in this country. Um, I just uh, left my role as president of SEIU 2015, where we represented 400,000 long-term care workers, most of them home care workers across the state of California. And I am proud that through our union, home care workers in the city of Los Angeles are gonna make $18 an hour at the end of their next contract. It's not enough to live in a city um, as expensive as Los Angeles, but it's a hell of a lot better than they where they would be without a contract. Workers who do the same work as those Los Angeles home care workers in the South and in other states make $7.25 an hour if they're lucky. Right, and so first we have to start by recognizing that this is real work that these women do. We have to recognize that they have been written out of labor laws, right? The same labor laws that were negotiated over um, in the 1940s when Tab Hartley and, and other bills were passed. Domestic workers were written out of the labor laws. Agricultural workers were written out of labor laws because they were black, and that was the deal that was cut. Farm workers were written out because they were brown. Like, so we gotta start telling the truth about our history and go back and include these workers in our economy so that we can begin to give them a real seat at the table and recognize that this is real important work, right? If we, can, if we pay real workers, train them to take care of seniors in their homes, we save our country billions of dollars because mm -hmm. folks won't go into facilities where they don't live as well as they would if they lived at home. If we pay workers mm -hmm. like Crystal and respect them for the educators and the nurturers of our children, we will have better outcomes, children will do better in school, right? And so we do have to strengthen our care economy. There is unfinished business. We were not able to get the investment in the Build Back Better Act that was passed last year, but we are not done. We are gonna continue to lift up and to support these millions of workers, mainly women, mainly women of color who are immigrants, we can build a new middle class yeah. around the millions of workers who do care work. It's work that's never gonna go away, right? You can't, um, you, you can't automate it, you can't ship it overseas, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, you know, we talk about the greening of our economy and a lot of folks who work in jobs that really need to go away because they're bad to our environment, right? Imagine if we can look at care work the same way we look um, at oil refinery work, right? And you pay someone, a child care provider, what you would pay someone who works at an oil refinery, right? Imagine the type of life these women and these children can live, right? If we just think differently about this work and how important it is to the future of our country. Yeah. All right, so Crystal, I saw you react to what April said, so I'm gonna give you a chance to say everything that, that your face just said. Um, you know, we know for a really long time that low wages for childcare workers and for care workers in general have been used to justify more affordable care. Like that's one way that people talk about it. Yet care is still not affordable. So Crystal, talk about that a little bit for us. Um, talk about why we need to raise childcare wages. Um, and if you could speak to other solutions that the government should consider to make that happen, we are listening. <laughs> um, I can honestly say that um, early childhood education is 
child care is the first formal form of education for children outside of their home. It is the first formal. They come to us, child care, so we have birth to five. They come to us and then they go to the public school system or wherever their parents are gonna send them. But they, they need to be ready. Right. And for these, uh, a lot of the parents, they can't afford it. They can't afford to have their children in a place that is safe, has an educational background, and it's very difficult for a parent to come to me and say, oh, well, I can't afford this. I try to direct them to a subsidy program that'll help them, but that still does not help. It does not help the parent all the time, and it definitely doesn't help the provider to keep our doors open because we don't get paid until two to three months later, which is a problem with keeping our doors open. Me personally, and a lot of providers in Maryland, we provide food for the children. So every Sunday, like clockwork, that is when I do my supply shopping. I am in the supermarket and I spent $435 last Sunday to provide food for the kids that I care for. Is that a part of tuition? No. That's just something that I do because it was embedded in me as a child. That was what my grandmothers did. So that is something that I provide. That is a part of the service I provide. The education, the supply stores, we are in the supply stores constantly. There is no break for me. There isn't. So if I go on, I, Example, I went on a cruise, my very first cruise, and I literally took my laptop and did work to make sure I was prepared for when we came back off of the cruise for the kids that came in the front door. So that right there is the dedication, and I don't think people see or understand that part of the dedication that we do. I think they just see us as the lady on the corner that watches the kids every once in a while. I'm not doing it. That's not what I'm doing. There's lesson plans. There's meal prep. We have vegetarians. We have vegans. We have children that can't drink milk. There's a process in this. And funding needs to be there to help the parents to make sure that their children are in a place that provides that type of service for them. That is what needs to happen. There should be a fund for parents and providers to make sure that your door is still open for the parents to make sure that their children are in a safe place. Pookie and them can't watch your kids. It's not safe. It's just not safe. I'm sorry to say it like that, but that's just how it got to be said. They can't watch your kids. Your child needs to be prepared for when they go to school. Like it was said earlier, in order for us to prepare, prepare them, there has to be funding. And what we do is preparing them for the future. We're teaching them how to not see color, how to see people as who they are and where they come from to meet them where they are. That's what we're teaching them. Not, it's not just the educational math reading. Uh, uh, it's not just that. It's a full circle. Children need to be in that type of environment. They really do. And in order for that environment to stay open, there has, there has to be funding. <laughs> there has to be funding. It just, it, it's no other way to say it. There has to be funding. And the funding needs to go directly to the people who are doing the care. I have noticed, and because I've been with SEIU for as long as I've been with, providers in Maryland did not know that we could unionize. We did not know that. A union? What? That's a thing? We did not realize that we could do that until I went to a meeting, and it was at the Acorn Building. <laughs> and I was just like, we could do that? That's, that's for us? Like, how? And I started organizing and speaking to providers throughout the state of Maryland. And my issue was not just my issue. It was everybody's. Everybody was having the same financial issue. And once we started organizing, we did get targeted. Mm -hmm. We did get targeted because they wanted us to stop. Oh, I, they didn't know my name. <laughs> I didn't stop. We did not stop. We weren't going to stop. We, there we go. That's what we did. We kept going. And we are the only organization in the state of Maryland that has a bargaining contract with the state in the Department of Education. We are the only one. So if there are issues and concerns that providers are having, we have our associations, we have other organizations, but the union is the only one that can bargain their contract. The only one. And I'm so grateful that I was a part of it. I really am.
But in order for us to keep that going, there has to be the funding. That it has to be. We have to work together. We teach children to work together every single day. Every day we teach them how to share. We teach them how to work together, how to work as a team. There's no I in team. We have to work as a team. How is it that we are, as adults can't do that? I do not understand that. I just do not. And my mother always said, people will show you. Go off their actions. And the actions that are being shown to child care is that you are not worth us funding. And I want you to hear that and understand that. It is being shown to us. The pandemic said, oh, you are all essential. Oh, oh, okay. But then after everything opened back up, it went back to what life is normal. Child care is not life is normal. We still going. It's still, we are still caring for these children. They still come in sick. It, parents still need to go to work. So you have to respect, again, respect. You have to respect what we do. And if we can't work together, how are the children going to figure out how to do it? As we're the adults, we're the examples that they see. And that's what we need. We need to be that example. Stop saying I'm going to be the example and be it. Mm. So that's a good segue into, um, let's talk a little bit about employers. We had a panel here a few weeks ago uh, on um, black businesses and good jobs and heard very powerfully how it's a good business model to be good to workers. It's a good business model to invest in workers. It makes you more profitable, it makes you a better business all around. These were small businesses. Um, talk a little bit about the role of employers in this conversation. Um, what is it that, uh, that you think employers could do to make sure that black workers are fully at the table and have equitable jobs? Fred, you mentioned this a little bit when you were talking about contractors. And to just pick up Crystal's point about partnerships, who are some of the other partners that you think should be in this conversation that we need to bring to the table? Well, I, I think employers play a very key role uh, in this overall economy. Um, you know, look, in organized labor, we have, particularly in the building trades, we have very good contractors, people that work with us you know, on a daily basis because they realize the value of workers in this country and they realize the value of work. But, you know, I mean, but we, 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 we have those players who, um, in the country who is quite the opposite. Look, I think that employers can really, really uh, be critical in terms of realizing that uh, everybody deserves an opportunity. I think that uh, you know there's issues in this country that we would like for more and more employers to consider. One of them is reentry opportunities for folks that's reintegrating back into society. Uh, we think that you know ban the box is outdated, is outmoded, is no longer necessary. It's one of those uh, situations where we think that employers have to really, really. Well, let me put it like this. We need to work together as union and employers, and we do that in most cases, in a lot of cases. But however, you know, we have some uh, employers who just don't get it, and we think that those employers should be, um, you know, don't have, well, I'm, I'm really talking about employers who fight unionism, who fight employees' uh, rights to organize and want to fire employees for organizing and that sort of anti-union activity is something that we still detest. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Sherry, any thoughts on this? What do you think of, what, tell me about the role, just, you know, like the role of, of a good employer in, in your life. What's that meant to you? Um, having a good employer, it makes it, um, it just makes it easier uh, when you're going about your day-to-day -day life. Um, like my management team at Johnson Controls, like whenever I have an issue, I can always call them. Mm -hmm. and they have an open door policy. Like you can always, you know, talk about things that um, may be affecting you. Um, I think just really listening to the employees mm -hmm. and um, Finding ways to resolve issues is yeah. like the best thing. Yeah, so important. Thank yeah. you, Crystal. How about you? Partnerships, um, employers, the role. You know, what's the 
the, the important role that somebody who we haven't talked about could play at the table. So I mean, uh, as an employee of myself, my daughter works with me. So I want to make sure she's happy. Mm -hmm. And in order to make sure she's happy and she has what she needs, if she wanted to join the union, go right ahead. Because that makes her happy. And it makes her feel safe. It makes her feel respected. She has the benefits that she'll be able to get. Um, I grew up with unions around me. My husband is HVAC, and he's in Local 486. So I know exactly the benefits of being in a union. Healthcare, absolutely. Um, I would never want to not be in a union. I would never want to be an employee of a company that did not allow me, allow me to unionize. Mm -hmm. That's something that I want to do because I, I obviously see something that's not working and you're not listening to me. And if you're not listening to me, then that means you're not a good employer. You have to be able to listen to your employees. You have to be able to see what they need. And if you can't give them what they need, let them go unionize and well, we'll get it. We will get it. So that's, as an employer, that's what I think. I think every organization needs to come to the table and see what, what the problem is and then fix it. Look, I think that um, we have to hold corporations accountable for bad behavior. Um, in California, fast food workers that have been organizing you know, for over 15 years were able to pass a bill, AB 257, that would allow um, workers an opportunity to sit down with the industry to just have a conversation about standards, right? And to set those standards. And the industry is, is gonna put that, um, is gonna referendize that bill and put it on the ballot and spend up to $200 million, if not more, to defeat, right, this, to, to overturn this law that was passed by the California legislature, signed by the governor, just because they don't want workers to have a voice. Like, it is something wrong with that. And I think we have to hold, um, folks accountable for that type of behavior. Starbucks, they're firing workers all across the country for wanting to stand up and have a voice at work. They're refusing to come to the bargaining table. We have to send a message to the fast food industry, to corporations like Starbucks and McDonald's and Jack in the Box that that type of behavior and treatment of workers won't be tolerated in this country. Right. Thank you. No, I think um, it's all been said today on this on, on this on this topic. I think you have good employers that that that, that uh, in all different industries that, that recognize uh, the will of the worker. Um, there's some good employers in this country that aren't unionized because they treat their workers with respect, uh, and then there are some other companies that, that just just you know the president says this. If, if if a worker wants to organize and signs that card, they should be willing to. Uh, listen to what their workers have to say, and not try and go around this, go around them. And I think that that's something that's really key here moving forward. We had we had some great, amazing employers on the stage last week uh, that were smaller businesses get going to be big eventually, and they talked about the importance of organized labor and, and with how they played in their companies. At least three of them did. Uh, and then I've had conversations with companies in this country that are very good to their unions and good to their workers. And, and then I have other ones that you know they won't say it to me, but I know they want no part of the conversation. So. I think as we go around, a lot of it goes back to education as well. That's great. All right. This is amazing, and I feel like we could all keep going. Um, but we are near the end of our time, so I'm going to ask one last question that is really just a lightning round. Um, whatever is at the um, top of your head on the question of, you know, Dr. King talked about the need for a revolution of values. And he said that, um, you know, the arc of the universe bends toward justice, but we also need good people who are bending it. Um, all of you are clearly doing that, uh, and you have to believe that it's possible in order to keep on doing what, what, what you all are doing. So if you could do one thing, as we're looking at you know, this vision of an economic, you know, economic justice and an economy that leaves no one behind, what would you say uh, you know, what do you want to leave everyone who's listening with? Like, what's the thing that you would say is the most important thing that needs to happen? How do we do that? Well, Dr. King also believed very strongly that you can't have racial justice without economic justice. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that we have a huge opportunity in this country because of the great work of this administration and this administration's vision to really, really change this wealth gap in this country by utilizing the resources, the historic amount of resources that's, that's, that's been made available through the CHIPS Act, the infrastructure bill, and uh, other legislation that this president put forward. We have an opportunity to really, really address the issue of economic fairness and economic justice. And um, you know, I think with all of us working together um, under the leadership of this administration, we have an opportunity to do that. Sherry, in your experience, what's the thing that's really important to achieving economic justice and racial justice? I say just being treated equal, you know, and um, having a voice, you know, because um, a lot of women, they're not looked at as equal to men in the workforce. So I just, I think that equality will help a lot. I think every uh, workers having a seat at the table. In order for things to change, we have to talk about it. We have to work together. <laughs> that is something that he stressed. You have to work together. You can't teach people how to work together and then become an adult and not do it. <laughs> you just, it just can't happen. That's how it works. But I think working together, workers at the table, having a seat at the table, in order to be heard. And don't just listen to what I'm saying, hear what I'm saying. Let it rotate in your brain a few times, <laughs> let it come out the other ear, and then let it follow, funnel all the way down to your heart so you will understand. Sometimes we always say, well, I know when people ask, what, well, what do you do all day? Well, come sit down <laughs> and do it with me. And I guarantee you, Employers that will actually go do those actual jobs don't want to do them in that context. They really don't. So I think working together as a team, having a seat at the table, and conversating. We, we can talk. Let's go get some wings and wine and sit down and talk. Um, other words of Dr. King that I live my life by is that power without love is reckless and abusive and love without power is anemic. And I think we have to center power in this country in the hands of those who don't have it um, and, and let workers have real power and real voice and be self-determinative over their lives in a way that is rooted in love and care for each other and for all humankind. Secretary, I'm gonna give you the last word. Let me just, uh, first of all, thank the panelists. Uh, you guys are amazing, and, and I think that. Um, thank you for your for your for your words and your fight you do every day. But also thank you for being here with us today. And, and I think that you know the question is an interesting question. It's hard to sum it up in, in, in one sentence or one line or two lines or three lines. I, I just hope as as we continue to move forward, whether you're an advocate on the stage or you're an advocate in this audience or you're watching on on TV or wherever you are. Um, we we have an opportunity at this moment in time to make a difference. Uh, we've talked about it for a hundred years, um, and you know we've made some incremental steps forward and some steps backwards and back and forth. And, and I do think that we have a unique opportunity at this moment in time to, to really make a difference. I think that um, I think of two times in my life, 9/11. Uh, After 9/11 happened, um, if you remember, when you're driving around, those of you old enough, we stopped beeping at each other. We stopped yelling at each other. We were nice to each other. We were talking to each other in, in the restaurants. And that lasted for about three weeks. Um, <laughs> and, and then in Boston, we had the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, and we had a similar experience. People lit candles outside the windows in memory of those we lost and the people that got hurt during that marathon bombing. Um, and, and so it, it shows us in hum humanity. We have that ability. We have that ability to care for someone else. And it's really important for us as we think about moving forward. What does that care mean? If you're a corporate giant and you're a billionaire, that care means sharing. That means taking care of your employees who make the money for you. If you're a contractor, it makes sure your, your employees are safe. If you're a union, making sure you're representing your workers. If you're an average person out there that have no way into, into it, everyone on this stage, 
um, talked one way or the other how unions impacted their life. It impacted my life. I grew up in a, a white Irish Catholic household. I talk about that all the time. But my immigrant father, if he didn't have a chance to join Labor's Local 223, I'm not sitting on this stage as the Secretary of Labor of the United States of America. So okay. let's let's create opportunities for people to be successful. And that's that's the best way I can say it. And again, and, and Deputy Secretary, thank you for being here. And I see uh, Deputy Secretary Graves here as well. I want to thank him for being here as well today. So thank you very much. Our distinguished panel to stay up here so people can continue to um, just bask in their amazingness while I introduce um, we're just gonna have two quick um, closing comments and the first I, I uh, teed this up before he arrived but I do want to say this now that he's here um, Deputy Secretary of Commerce Don Graves is he, he brings to this administration um, and to our country decades of experience in the private sector in government he's been a trusted advisor to our president for a long time and I will just say that um, because of his leadership at the Department of Commerce for the first time, really, I think ever in history, the Department of Labor and the Department of Commerce have worked in partnership across a whole bunch of things, including coming up with shared job quality principles, what makes a good job, like to have the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor to have shared ideas about what that means is part of what Fred mentioned about this historic moment that we're in and what the Secretary mentioned. Um, and he is our partner in helping to make sure that these investments that we're talking about really include the job quality issues that we've mentioned here, including um, attention paid to child care. So I'm going to introduce uh, an amazing leader um, uh, who is visionary in so many ways, who is bringing his heart and his passion, including for workers and for unions, uh, to the work of the administration inside the Department of Commerce, my friend, Deputy Secretary Don Graves. Well, thank you for bearing with me and, and recognizing these leaders. And it was important for me to recognize them because they are the most important people in the room today. Uh, it's not, I, M Marty and, and, and Julie are dear, dear friends, and they are very important people, but it's the other folks that are on the stage today that are the real heroes, the real leaders, and the most important people uh, that we can uh, have at the stage today. So thank you for everything that you're doing. And, and, you know, it, it's, it, I want to thank uh, the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary for having this event today, for inviting me to participate. Um, many of you, I mean, you've, you've heard what, what Julie said, but many of you may be wondering why the Deputy Secretary of Commerce would be showing up at, uh, at an event uh, for Black History Month at the Department of Labor. Isn't the Department of Commerce the, the Department of big companies and CEOs, isn't that what the Department of Commerce is? Well, we, we do represent uh, or work to support a range of businesses, and we work with CEOs of all stripes. But the Commerce Department's official mi mission, and I don't, I'm going to read this to make sure that I don't get it wrong, the official mission for decades has been to create the conditions for economic growth and opportunity. But when we took office, one of the things that I was bound and, deter and determined to do was to make sure that we just we weren't just that department of business as so many people think of when they think of, of commerce. It was important for people to recognize that what we really are is the department of people and communities. For if you don't have people and communities, then you aren't going to have businesses. So it was important for, for me and I know for Secretary Raimondo to make sure that we recognize commerce for what it really is. And so we changed the mission and added three words to the end of that mission statement. So it now reads, to create the conditions for economic growth and opportunity for all communities. For all communities. It's critically important. <laughs> and so the reason that we partner together isn't just because Marty and Julie and Gina and Don are friends, and we are friends. We, we actually go out uh, and have dinner together. We spend a lot of time together. 
it's not just because we're friends, it's also because it's absolutely vital for our national competitiveness that, as the president says, that everyone is dealt into the bargain, the economic bargain of this country. We know that that's not happened for everyone for many, 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 many years. It's important that all of our workers, all of our workers have opportunities and that we level the playing field for our workers and our companies, not just here, but all across the globe. Providing good jobs for all workers is, import is an important task. We've lived through several historic moments and, and Mr. Secretary, I would, add, I would submit there's one additional time period where we as a nation began to have that come to, coming together and that was after the murder, the brutal murder of George Floyd when the nation recognized that, you know what, we didn't deal everyone into the economic bargain and that's had ramifications. Obviously, that was very, very short-lived, that, that moment of, uh, of reconciliation. And then we had the pandemic and that's changed all of our lives on a daily basis, including the way that we work, the way that American workers seek new opportunities and look for quality jobs and that US employers are transforming how they do business. Increasingly, we've all seen this, we know that access to the new high quality jobs of the future and is, is dependent on us giving people the tools that they need to be able to access those jobs, to be able to find those jobs, to have pathways into those jobs. So it's important for us to make sure that we're expanding and diversifying our country's workforce and create those pathways and give folks those tools. As you, you don't, no doubt know, and as uh, the Deputy Secretary and Secretary said, we have a once in a generation opportunity for investment. Fred and I have talked about this. This administration has this one opportunity. It may never happen again in our lifetimes or even maybe in our kids' lifetimes that we have this opportunity to invest in our infrastructure, to build high-speed internet to every household, not just some households, every household, every business, every community, every street in the country to make sure that we support our domestic semiconductor industry in a way that creates opportunities in every community in the country, that creates pathways into not just the PhDs or the engineering jobs, but for the construction workers who are building these, uh, these facilities, for the engineers and the technicians who are going to support these facilities all across the country. And it's also important that we make these investments in a way that we're combating climate change in a way that protects our communities and creates the jobs of the future. So the Commerce Department and the entire administration are committed to ensuring that underrepresented workers and underrepresented communities can partake, can partake in the unprecedented opportunities that these investments are bringing. We're working, as you know, to build a more inclusive economy that grows from the bottom up and the middle out. As a descendant, of slaves, a descendant of entrepreneurs, a descendant of one of America's first black patent holders, as well as, and I am gonna say, as well as countless family members who cleaned our federal departments. Before, long before there was the Colored National Labor Union which protected their rights, they were toiling away long hours, late into the night, cleaning our nation's buildings. And as a child of members of the teachers union, in Cleveland, I know how important it is that we focus on protecting America's workers, making sure that they have access to all of the benefits, protections that they need to be successful. I understand the importance of supporting and centering workers in everything that we do. Supporting entrepreneurs and innovators and businesses from historically underserved communities as well. That's exactly what we're aiming to do at Commerce in all of our work with the Department of Labor. We've consulted with experts and labor unions and think tanks, the White House, Department of Labor, on the drivers of job quality. That's how we got to this, uh, this good jobs principles that the Deputy Secretary talked about. It's the first time, I think, in our history that we've had this type of collaboration between the Department of Labor and the Department of Commerce, the Department of Workers and the Department of People and Communities. So together we publish those good jobs principles that create a framework and a shared vision for what constitutes good jobs. So I want to thank again my partners and friends, Julie and Marty, for that. 
It sets clear expectations about the jobs and, uh, and what we are going to create through these historic investments. What we are expecting as a government, when you get these resources, when you get these investments, you're going to abide by these good jobs principles. The Commerce Department also released a job quality toolkit based on everything that we did in partnership with the Department of Labor to provide strategies for small and medium-sized enterprises to improve workers' experiences, to build on the good jobs principles. And we're deploying that toolkit with our national small and medium manufacturers through our Manufacturing Extension Partnership, with our Minority Business Development Agency, with our Economic Development Administration, and in every aspect of what we do to, to grow our economy. Increasing job quality, we know it leads to worker satisfaction and engagement. That translates into increased enthusiasm. It, incre it leads to lower absenteeism, higher retention, improved products and services, and importantly, higher revenues. Job quality equals higher revenues. Who would have thought about that? But our work doesn't just stop there on advancing equity and supporting job quality. The Minority Business Development Agency, the single agency in the federal government whose mandate is to support the growth and long-term sustainability of minority businesses and other underserved businesses. MBDA has a new $93.5 billion capital readiness program, the largest of the kind in the history of, of the Commerce Department and the MBDA, focusing on supporting minority and, uh, and other entrepreneurs to launch and scale their businesses because we know that scale is critically important. We know that minority businesses employ, percentage-wise, more minorities than do any other businesses. So if you can get them to scale, that means you're going to have a whole lot more minority uh, 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 workers in these businesses with good jobs, quality jobs in their own communities. At the Patent and Trademark Office, the Council on Inclusive Innovation is expanding the scope of innovation ecosystem to reach communities that have, that have been historically left out. We know it's, it's unfortunate, but as I said, I'm a descendant of one of the first black patent holders. The, the unfortunate thing is, in the intervening 150 years, there haven't been that many minority uh, patent holders that have come behind. And last summer, the Economic Development Administration announced 32 awardees of the $500 million Good Jobs Challenge, again, built off of everything that we did in partnership with the Department of Labor, funded by, the, um, uh, by President Biden's American Rescue Plan. What that's led to is specific opportunities in communities, like in Birmingham, funding a partnership that provides marginalized communities with pathways into quality health care uh, jobs, and an $11 million award to the Hampton Roads Workforce Council is building a talent pipeline for clean energy, resilience, and blue economy jobs. Hampton Roads, it's one of the largest African-American populations in the nation. And in Boston, Marty, you know this, in partnership with over 100 local employers, we, we partnered with the Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston for the clean energy sector, led by the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology, an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. It's partnering with local unions to develop skilled journeymen, uh, journeymen workers to develop clean energy infrastructure. These partnerships, again, are centering workers at everything that they do, and they're going to place thousands of local Boston residents into high-paying jobs with a focus on supporting women and communities of color. So I'm proud of the work that we're doing at Commerce and the entire administration to focus on this. Um, I hope that you see that we are not your father's or grandfather's or great-grandfather's Department of Commerce. We, again, are centering worker, workers at, with everything that we do, all of our programs, and we're partnering with our friends at the Department of Labor because if we don't do that, we're not going to have a successful economy. We're not going to build the inclusive economy that we deserve, and we're not going to have the competitive economy that, as the Kellogg Foundation says, will be $8 trillion bigger if we can eliminate those systemic uh, uh, roots of racism in our country. $8 trillion, so it's the $28 trillion economy, that's not chump change. So I am so proud to be here. Thank you for everything 
that you do, uh, my partners and friends, uh, Julie and Marty. I want to thank our friends uh, uh, who joined us up on stage, uh, and especially our partners in, uh, in labor, the AFL-CIO, uh, has been a great partner in everything we do. Thank you for giving me a few minutes. Good to see you all. All right, so when the president says that uh, his entire administration is committed to this worker-centered economy, um, you know that he means it. Um, and you know, people say leadership matters, and we've certainly seen it matter with Don's uh, role at, the, at Commerce. Um, I should also mention that a a among those good jobs principles is the right to organize and the right to join a union in the workplace. Um, so um, we have just one last speaker, but I just wanted to take one more second to say, um, to acknowledge one more person who was really key in bringing uh, today um, to life. So uh, a few weeks ago, I said that I wanted to do an event like this uh, that honored black workers uh, during Black History Month. And I said I would love to have uh, Fred Redman and April Verrett on that panel. And I would love to have workers who are showing the way with what they do um, in industries that are going to be the future of our 21st century economy on that panel. Um, and I would love uh, to also include Don Graves. And um, in addition to Alessia and Caitlin, who the secretary already mentioned, Betty Hung um, <laughs> jumped to action um, and uh, is as responsible as anybody uh, for, for the magic that you saw happen here today. Um, and Betty has herself a long history of being um, an advocate uh, for black workers. She was one of the original board members of the Black Worker Center when it was forming in California. And um, thank you, Betty, for everything you've done to bring us here. Um, so our last speaker is somebody that the secretary already mentioned uh, at the top. And the reason why we talk about her all the time is that it is impossible to truly express the greatness that is Caitlin Walker Mooney in mere words. Um, you know, the secretary said that there's one thing, it's one thing to have ideas, it's another thing to put them into action. And in all honesty, the Good Jobs Initiative was an idea. It was an idea in the secretary's mind. It was an idea that would help further the president's vision. But that idea has come to fruition to the tune of almost $100 billion across the administration, to the tune of all kinds of principles across the DOL and in, in, in other parts of the Biden-Harris administration, and to the tune of her endless, consistent voice for racial justice and economic justice um, in, uh, in the world, not just in the economy. And so uh, Caitlin Walker Mooney was the one person we thought should come and bring this home for us. So Caitlin, up your turn. Woo, y'all. <laughs> this has been an amazing day. I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, I also wanna shout out Depset Graves for being from Cleveland V2, 216. Um, <laughs> I have a lot more shout outs. I promise I won't mention my mom, but I do have to honor Betty for being the architect of this event. Betty's tireless work is the reason why we are all here today. Betty, um, Amit, Zeke, all the people um, from OSAM, BOC, who actually make these things possible, from the janitors and custodians who make our building clean and healthy. I just have to thank everyone here because it was a true team effort. Um, hearing from each of our panelists about their journeys into the labor movement, the invaluable work they do, their visions for empowering all workers, and their stage advice to the federal government was incredible. Let's give it up for our panelists one more time. We have a lot of work to do. We have so much work to do. Today, we focus on the critical role black workers must play in making our infrastructure, manufacturing, and climate investments a success because we have to make sure every community benefits. We know that focusing on black workers helps all workers, and we know that the exploitation of black workers also hurts all workers. We heard our panelists say this multiple times today, and I can't help myself, so I'm gonna give you one more example of what this actually means. All tipped workers still feel the ramifications of anti-black policies that were baked into our minimum wage laws to this very day. In the 2023 of our Beyonce year, we are still experiencing the ramifications of this. When Congress passed the federal, federal minimum wage law in 1938, members of Congress committed to the economic exploitation of black workers, specifically, honestly, said it on the Congressional House floor and in the Senate, they were worried about the shared economic prosperity that a federal wage floor could create. And what they did is they included numerous carve-outs. We also heard about how this appeared in the National Labor Relations Act. 
farm work, domestic work, and tip work were all designed to keep black folks from being paired to pay wage. Decades later, these carve-outs were eliminated, but their impacts are still felt today. Just looking at tip workers in the restaurant industry, today, the federal tip minimum wage is only $2.13 an hour. In 2018, 17% of tip workers of color and 13% of all tip workers were living in poverty. And in states that have eliminated the tip minimum wage, folks who would otherwise be tip workers have a lower poverty rate. So you can see that policy, that anti-black policy decision, still currently holding everyone back, not just black workers. <laughs> and while baked in discrimination persists in our labor market, as evidenced in part by the gender and race pay gaps that many of our folks today talked about, our entire nation misses out. Folks have said this multiple times. The Washington Center for Equitable Growth also said this in 2019. We would have had 7.2 trillion more dollars in our GDP if we eliminated racial, ethnic, and gender inequities in the labor market. So now, what are we gonna do? Like, what are we gonna do about that? The Biden-Harris administration has made historic investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Trillions of dollars are being dispersed by the federal government, and this administration is working hard to ensure that equity and good jobs are baked in, into our investments. And as you heard earlier, the federal government has not been good at this, so this is hard. <laughs> this is our first time really actually trying to do this for all the people that should be benefiting from these laws and these investments. Um, Secretary Treasurer Redmond mentioned this. If you look at our past public works projects, including the New Deal, past highway construction, we've missed the mark. But this administration knows it's essential that we tap into the talent of all workers to make our investments a success and for our national competitiveness. For all those who joined us, I have a few next steps, a few do outs. <laughs> you know me, I'm always gonna come with an ask. Um, so here I go. Workers, please continue to exercise your worker rights. Please continue to join together to organize and collectively bargain. In doing so, you make workplaces better for you, your coworkers, and entire communities. Please continue to let us know, the federal government, how we can support you. Submit complaints to us. We do all kinds of investigations and enforcement. Secretary Walsh mentioned it. We want to hear from you. You know what's best, and we will come in there. Employers, please continue to create good jobs. Recruit, retain, hire, and promote diverse talent. Provide key benefits. Respect workers' choice to union organize. Respect workers' choice to union organize and collectively bargain. Secretary Treasurer Verrett mentioned this, first contracts are key. Engage in collaborative collective bargaining in good faith, it's the law. Pay family sustaining wages and continue to invest in your workers' development. And please let us, the federal government, know how we can best support you. We've got trillions of dollars here. Everyone should be sharing from those investments and benefiting. Folks on the ground, for folks doing this work in states, localities, workforce development entities and boards, civil rights groups, labor unions, and community-based organizations, Please continue to engage in sector and place-based partnerships. Partner with folks you don't like. Partner with folks who've never been good to you. Organize them and partner. Work together to make this real and actionable. And then also hold us accountable. Make sure that we're capitalizing on your hard work that you guys have engaged in to create equitable workforce development pipelines and good jobs. And then to my federal family friends, please continue to work collaboratively on our shared goals to build up our infrastructure, to increase our manufacturing capacity, and to address the climate crisis, all while ensuring equitable access to good jobs. Please continue to utilize all level levers within our legal authorities <laughs> to empower communities and to reach folks who have been on the margins for far too long. Please continue to incentivize equity, job quality, worker empowerment, and key partnerships in our investments. Shout out to Commerce, shout out to Transportation, who I see in the back, shout out to Energy for making this work real. I encourage everyone else to do the same. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up now because I'm stopping us from a, a schmoozing session and some nice snacks and coffee outside, but I wanna note, we've definitely got our work cut out for us, but we've gotta do it. Our lives actually <laughs> depend on it. Um, it's now my honor to reintroduce our dynamic, strategic, and brilliant Deputy Secretary, who has dedicated her entire career to fighting for all worker rights, particularly centering those at the margins to the benefit of us all. Deputy Secretary Sue. All right, well, I am definitely smart enough not to try to talk after Caitlin. So with that, thank you all so, so much to the panelists. I promise you that here at the Department of Labor, we are 100% in it. 
uh, to win the things that, that, that we talked about here today. And we recognize the historic nature of the moment and the urgency of everything that needs to be done. Um, to everybody who, who came to, to speak, to everybody who came to listen, thank you for that. But more importantly, thank you for carrying forward both the spirit of this uh, conversation and the actual doing of what needs to get done to reach a truly um, racially and economically just society that we're in. So thank you all very, very much. And please hang out. There's tables outside. Um, please mingle. Please get to know each other. I'm not going to say anything different from what Crystal, our wonderful child care educator, said, which is we've got to do this together. So let's get to know each other and roll up our sleeves and let's do that work. <laughs>